Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the penultimate lecture in the Barbados Museum and the University of the West Indies Cave Hills uh, annual lecture series. Uh, in this, the 90th anniversary year of the Barbados Museum and Historical Society. Today's lecture is entitled Centering Community-Led Curatorial Practices at the Barbados Museum and Historical Society. And it is being given by Mrs. Natalie McGuire Batson, who is a PhD candidate in cultural studies at the University of the West Indies, as well as our curator of social history and engagement. So just a little bit about the lecture this evening. Uh, the museum's curatorial framework has gone through a series of transitions in the past few decades, shifting from models of traditional object-oriented exhibitions to community-led curatorial practices that prioritize inclusivity, multivotality, and co-curation in presenting history and heritage. This lecture will share recent examples of democratic curatorship at the museum and discuss its development in the context of social museology, both within the Caribbean and internationally. Barbadian curator Nahli Maguire Batson centers her, her practice on community led methodology in museology of the global south and its exchanges with the post empire global north. Having completed a BA in History of Art at the University of Leicester and an MA in Museums and Cultural Heritage at the University of Auckland, she is currently a PhD candidate in Cultural Studies at the University of the West Indies Cave Hill with a research focused on Caribbean museology. She is the Curator of Social History and Community Engagement at the Barbados Museum and Historical Society and serves on several committees, including as Public Relations Officer for ICOM Barbados, a member of the Executive Board for the International Committee for Museology of Latin America and the Caribbean, and a board member of the Barbados National Art Gallery. Please join me this evening in welcoming Nahali as she speaks to us on centering community-led curatorial practices at the Barbados Museum and Historical Society. Thank you, Kay, and thank you so much to the organizing committee of this year's lecture series for inviting me to be a part of the program amongst all of our esteemed speakers. It really is an honor. In this lecture, I will share recent examples of community-led curatorship at the museum and discuss its development in the context of social museology. Defining what we mean by community in museology is multifaceted. Museum practitioners have long flagged that one blanket term cannot justify an interwoven network that is full of multiplicities and self-determination involved in meaning-making and identifying in relation to the museum space. For the purpose of this lecture, I propose to leave the term open-ended, encompassing many realities and identities in relation to the Barbados Museum and Historical Society, both here and elsewhere, tangibly and intangibly. Similarly, it can be recognized that inclusiveness in museology can take many forms, from being considerate of different physical and learning abilities, to ensuring equal representation and openness across racial and socioeconomic barriers, to having publics lead in cultural projects in museum spaces. But arguably the underlying connection between these outputs is the recognition of putting communities' voices and participation at the forefront of museology. This is particularly significant in a Caribbean context where museums and related cultural spaces have been undertaking reparative introspection, aiming to shed their colonial foundations. We can reflect that museums as modern institutions have a history of policy tied to colonialism, taking form in the late 18th and early 19th century Europe as buildings to showcase objects conquered and collected, an analogy as Bennett would say perhaps to the nations being conquered and collected simultaneously, and to glorify imperialism through the material culture of the oppressed. This has also greatly influenced the discipline of museology. But what do we even mean by museology? Although a seemingly straightforward term, the process of defining the parameters of museology as a discipline is complex. This slide is not an exhaustive list, but shares glimpses into the schools of thought that we're touching on in the context of this lecture. An introduction to the history of the discipline can be found in the work of Bruno Brulon Suarez, who outlines that three broad types of museology first developed. 
There was normative museology, which is described as marked by a dictionarianism of museum knowledge and aimed to shape the field in its early years when it was solely connected to museum practice. And there's theoretical museology, which refers to the precise task of establishing the International Committee for Museology under the International Council of Museums, ICOM, as a committee to pursue the theory of museology, specifically to align it with the social sciences or attempt to. And thirdly, reflexive museology, which marked the shift from museology as a science to museology as interdisciplinary studies. In addition is the recognition that museology was being developed in different schools of thought throughout different geographical regions, namely Latin America, France, and Germany, who were more inclined to consider museology as a science, and the UK and North America, who endeavored to explore more of the humanities aspect of museology, eventually leading into museum studies branches. With imperial breakdown in the 20th century, the function of the post-colonial museum shifted to become an institution to construct national identity and strive to integrate the changing cultural makeup while serving communities in order to remain relevant. While slowly transitioning in museum practice, theoretically this was articulated through the School of New Museology, which was formed in Europe in the 1970s in part as a way of rationalizing and charting a path for theoretical museology whilst attempting to address power structures within museum spaces and advocating for democratized museum processes. In new museology, the shift in thinking on the museum's role and a critical reevaluation of museum policies around display and integration inform and expand museum practice. The direction towards a more reflexive and people-centered museum included paradigms of living museums and eco-museums and often emphasize the importance of community inclusion and developing sustainable relationships. However, the limitations of applying new museology in the local context of the Global South became emergent almost immediately. One significant event that shifted this trajectory was the Roundtable of Santiago and Chile in 1972. This meeting was coordinated by UNESCO and brought museologists together with wider cultural practitioners from Central and South America to discuss the role of museums in contemporary society. As a result of the days of proceedings and planning, a set of resolutions were drawn and proposed to UNESCO on an idea of an integral museum, one that is active in local society and recontextualizes the objects it ex exhibits. New museology, however, continued to take on a Eurocentric and universal role for museum practice and continues to be critiqued in Latin America, specifically through the notion put forward by Brazilian museologist Mario Chagas of a social museology. Social museology is described by Chagas as committed to reducing social injustices and inequalities, to combat prejudice, to improve the quality of collective life, to strengthen dignity and social cohesion, to use the power of memory, heritage, and the museum in favor of the general population, the indigenous peoples, the social movements, including LGBTQI, and the landless rural worker movements and others. It highlights that the broad conditions of new museology negate the socio-political realities of Latin American countries and pacifies the discipline when it should take an active when it should be an active participant in resolving community issues. So, social museology takes to heart the recommendations of the 1972 Roundtable of Santiago and Chile, specifically that the museum is an institution at the service of society of which it forms an inseparable part and of its very nature contains the elements which enable it to help molding the consciousness of the communities it serves through which it can stimulate those communities to action by projecting forward its historical activities so that they culminate in the presentation of contemporary problems. That is to say, by linking together past and present, identifying itself with the indispensable structural changes and calling forth others appropriate to its particular national context. That this approach does not deny the value of existing museums, nor does it imply abandoning the principles of specialized museums. 
It is put forward as the most rational and logical course of development for museums so that they may best serve society's needs, then in some cases, the proposed change may be introduced gradually or on an experimental basis. In others, it may provide the basic orientation. The Latin American discourse has further entrenched museology and complexness, resulting in the discipline being less amenable to a singular definition. The theories generated in the region were critical of the concept of a universal museology and to the standardization of the discipline, citing that specific local context shape and the relevance and application of museology in different areas of the globe. Hispanic Caribbean museology was also given its voice in Latin America, most notably through Cuban theorist Marta Arjona Perez. Perez wrote extensively on the role museums have in social and educational development, particularly policymaking. She was very aware that museums as heritage sites were separate to the dichotomies of class. She advocated for more radical and revolutionary processes in academic training in museums and in exhibition practices, calling on her European ICOM colleagues in 1977 to think about the great dispossessed masses that are still waiting to see themselves reflected in a display cabinet. Despite our geographical closeness to Latin America, Eurocentric models of museology are often imposed onto museums in the Caribbean region through international policies and partnerships. This can often cloud opportunities for curatorial models to be generated out of localized practice and sometimes results in a profound marginalization of Caribbean voices influencing the development of international museological policy. Rather, we are often considered as a region to be guided. From the time that Sir Hans Sloan began collecting objects of natural history and ethnography in the late 1600s, using exhibitionary practices as tools of British cultural hegemony, it has also resulted in several centuries of people of African descent in the Anglophone Caribbean being denied opportunities to represent their own stories in local museums, silencing shared heritages that span far beyond the 400 year time frame that museums often begin Caribbean social histories at and far beyond the geography of the Caribbean basin. However, there has been critical contemporary scholarship and practice to review the legacies of this imperialistic museology. Donna McFarlane, for instance, employed critical race theory to critique the Jamaican folk museum's attempts to represent blackness, as she wrote that for the black population surrounding the museum, there is little identification with attachment to or ownership of the museum. She noted the emphasis on objects as central to the narrative of the museum removed any agency or relevance to independent Black Jamaicans, and that it would have been more useful to try and chart human stories and provide critical readings of historical contexts in which the objects would have been used. Winston Fugilance echoes the role of critical interpretive material as key in the preservation of sites of memory in the Caribbean as well. For example, colonial buildings and forts to combat erasure of enslaved stories in relation to the history of these sites. And Alessandra Cummings research is also a significant point of reference and outlines that to reduce the risks of erasure of narratives of the enslaved in Caribbean museums, we need to continue developing Caribbean practices that highlight our relational connections and challenge the hegemony of new museology. Considering museum practice today, it can be argued that museum work and museum theoretical research are intertwined and should not be separated by a hierarchy of knowledge across the museum field, where the scientific ambition of museology often generates a higher amount of validity than the practical work conducted in the museums. And so that brings us to the curatorial practices of the Barbados Museum and Historical Society. Like most museums in the world, the, in the first half of the 20th century, the curatorial approach to the Barbados Museum was one that prioritized the facts and information that objects held in relation to Barbadian and British history. Although there had been pockets of community engagement, notably through the program of contemporary art exhibitions in our education championed by Neville Connell, the priority of collecting specimens of natural history, archaeology, and objects of empire, such as military insignia and domestic items from colonial plantation great houses, 
firmly placed the Barbados Museum in a so-called cabinet of curiosity model of exhibition making. As we've heard in detail from our wonderful previous lectures within this series, revisionist work at the Barbados Museum really accelerated in the 1980s and 1990s, where the museum further considered its role in society, decolonizing its organizational structure, exhibitions, and programming. It also firmly prioritized how it could be for people, about people, and host open days, as well as go out into communities, developing with them traveling exhibitions through the National Library Service, temporary community museums, such as the one in Whole Town, cultural displays, and educational programming. Taking an exhibition outside of a traditional museum space and into a community-led space often allows for alternate methods of engagement and feedback by publics. Community centers, particularly the National Library Service, are often more accessible and welcoming to a wider range of people, which can lead to a more diverse and engaged audience. These spaces may also have closer ties to the local community and can often allow for a more dynamic and interactive experience for visitors. This can result in a deeper level of engagement and feedback from the public, which can be valuable for museums, curators, and community members. But the museum was also doing a lot of introspective work within its own collections and displays and has a history of developing artistic interventions as one example of a way of deepening our understanding of histories, as well as recognizing that performance, especially theater as a medium can be powerful for articulating heritage and connecting with youth. And community engagement programs more recently also exist in a digital sphere as well. For example, Barbados Beyond Boundaries, which is a community led digital map where individuals, organizations, and collectives can share their experience of Barbadianness wherever they reside in the world. And the museum has collaborated with communities and entities to share their diverse histories through exhibitions and projects like Caribbean Ties, Beijing to Bridgetown, Centenarians of Barbados, Bengal to Barbados, and many others. It was on this foundation of reimagining what the Barbados Museum and Historical Society could be that recent exhibitions were able to adapt existing models of curatorship and explore experimental museology for community-led histories, centering the Barbados Museum as a producer of progressive democratic curatorship. Although I cannot cover all of the projects and the extensive work that the museum has done today, I would like to share three examples with you. A project in particular where community-led methodologies were experimented with was in the 2018 Artistic Interventions, where members of the creative community were invited to critically engage with the Barbados Museum's collections through a series of interventions. Six artists were interwoven in the museum's galleries, interrogating and recontextualizing the historical narratives on display. The artists who participated had actively expressed interest in engaging with the collections at the museum previously, and the project employed a methodology I was developing as part of my PhD research, which prioritized multivocality in exhibition interpretation. This was a rhizomatic research approach based on the concept of rhizomes as written by Caribbean theorist Edouard Glissant who draws on the original philosophy of Deleuze and Guattari regarding meaning making as a constant assemblage of multiple points of knowledge, but locates the idea of rhizomes in the neo-colonial realities of the Caribbean. Translated for museum work, a rhizomatic approach in museology recognizes that knowledge production is not apolitical and proposes principles of multivocality through assemblage, a relational ecology of research methodology, and the co-production of, of participatory accessible research projects, such as the Artistic Interventions exhibition. Unlike previous approaches to museum engagement via visual arts, where pieces may be commissioned to be displayed in a gallery as a kind of response, artists communicated with the Barbados Museum's permanent or long-term galleries through works that they had in their portfolio that they felt could expand on the concepts that we were presenting. Artists scheduled individual walkthroughs of all the galleries, speaking about their work and the collections. And then from those discussions, the decision was made organically about which work they wanted to include, where they wished to include them, 
how the installation should look and how we can encourage engagement. This again is often seen as a different curatorial approach and that myself as a curator was in more of a facilitate, facilitation role and the artists were taking ownership of how the interactions and discussions would ideally take place. Furthermore, the artists were video interviewed speaking about the interventions and a video of their collective responses became the curatorial essay as opposed to something that would have been written from the institution. This again differs in tradition, which would dictate that the curator write the theoretical framework in the essay that places these works within it and contextualize it through the lens of the museum as an institution. This was all an attempt to decentralize authority in curatorship and have the project become a multivocal exchange between the museum's collections and the six artists. And in the vein of that multivocality, I just wanted to share one of the participating artists, Lenora Allen discussing her perception and her engagement with the works of Augustina Brunius, which are on display in our Cunard Gallery. And I was really affected by the Cunard Gallery because it showed a very plantation, it represented plantation life across the, across the region. And so that stuck with me. And as I was making the sugar cane pieces, um, Augustino Brunius's prints were very much in my mind. I was making those pieces because I didn't feel that the work the prints and the lithographs that were included in that collection really reflected the life of the slaves or the enslaved or even the free mulattoes that were in that society. So I wanted to just give a, another side to that um, where these enslaved people, these people that you didn't see in these lithographs did have a life, did have a sexual life as well and a hidden life that would not necessarily have even come to Brunius's Bernice, uh, mind to depict in the way he does. This project really opened the possibilities for the kind of curatorial work that I wanted to engage in in the museum space and that was facilitated and supported by the institution. And the second project with, which built on this idea of community-led museology as a intertwining of theory and practice launched in March 2019, where the Barbados Museum, Life and Leggings, Caribbean Alliance Against Gender-Based Violence, and the Barbados Youth Development Council created a platform to discuss Barbadian activism in relation to social change. The co-curators of the, the exhibition were Samia Cumberbatch from the Barbados Youth Development Council, Renelle King from Life and Leggings, and myself from the museum. Titled Insurgents, Redefining Rebellion in Barbados, the interactive exhibition aimed to analyze historical instances of resistance from plantation rebellion to labor and social riots, as well as contemporary sites of activism for Barbadian civil rights. The partnership within this exhibition reflected a commitment by the Barbados Museum to facilitate discussions on contested histories in Barbados and follow up and followed on from previous exhibitions by the museum regarding rebellion and resistance, such as riots in Milan from 2012 for the 75th anniversary of the 1937 labor rebellion and freedom we must fight for it, the 1816 rebellion and its aftermath for the bicentennial of the 1816 rebellion. The display of insurgents was formatted to be accessible for visitors of all physical and learning abilities and visitor participation was key with the exhibition content, including contrib contrib contributions from those visiting the space in a variety of mediums from written feedback to video contributions. The background to this exhibition came from a desire by the communities of Life and Leggings and the Barbados Youth Development Council to address the social trope that Barbadians are passive when it comes to acts of resistance. In developing the content, priority was given to oral histories, which spoke to the nature of, the in, of intersectional activism in Barbados. Local activists needed to be presented as pioneers in their own right, asserting that Barbadian movements are independent to those that were in the global north. In an interview leading up to the exhibition launch, Kamarbach and King stressed the importance of dispelling myths surrounding what activism is, understanding various forms of activism and doing both of those things through the multiple voices of their communities. This articulates the exhibition aims, which were to revise the historical view on Barbadians relationship with activism, 
to highlight the unique way protesting happens in Barbados and to emphasize the exhibition space as a place to discuss contemporary issues. Although there were a handful of artifacts on display and five interpretive panels, the emphasis of the exhibition content really was in the oral histories of activism and the living installation of protest placards, some which were already in the museum's collection and some which were contributed through the community open call or made in the gallery space and hung straight onto the installation. The panels in this exhibition were developed by women-led community stakeholders serving as co-curators, as well as drawing from interviews with activist leaders. Academia and museology often dictate that only particular writing styles or voices constitute valid critical voices and in interpretation material. However, when facilitating an equitable process in co-curation, it is important to place value on voices that are often marginalized or spoken on behalf of in museum academic work, presenting their contributions as a visible part of the cohesive narrative, rather than as a quoted element or an element that is then required to be critically interpreted. In doing so, we challenge the notion that critical authority can only lie with the museum practitioner. The Insurgents exhibition was developed in the vein of post-critical museology as a form of social museology by Dudney et al, Post-critical museology takes on a democratic approach to collaboration with communities in the research and development of museum projects. And insurgents arguably did this on multiple levels. The co-curation with entities is one step further from collaboration in that the groups worked with the museum from the inception of the project and at every stage through design, development, implementation, installation, programming, and deinstallation. This is a more involved approach than, for example, holding committee meetings to inform the content of an exhibition. On a content level, this was done through further community integration via the open call for stories of activism. And these stories were received in multiple mediums, including videos and tangible artifacts, such as placards and t-shirts. The most common contributions were video interviews which were then assembled and displayed on two video monitors as part of the exhibition display. The museum also collaborated with the University of the West Indies Department of History and Philosophy on this component. And students joined the exhibition team conducting research into educational tools based on the historical instances of activism that could both contribute to the exhibition development and their own academic portfolio. For one of the children's educational products, an animation we created titled Activist Imani, the team worked with a 14-year-old Imani on the language and approach to assure, ensure that we were connecting with audiences of that age. While the exhibition was open in the museum, participation took precedence at an involved level with the opportunity for visitors themselves to add to the content. This could be in the form of creating a placard, um, it could also be done through sharing a video through the tablet or adding to our acti activity board. Visitor participation in terms of accessibility of content was also a co-curated process. The team worked with the National Society for the Blind to ensure that all of the exhibition panels and labels were translated correctly in Braille and that the interactive tablets had the voice activation setting on and that the way in which those that are visually impaired could move around the space was accurately um, adapted. There is also an audio version of the timeline available in the exhibition space and a social narrative was created for any young visitors with autism wishing to experience the exhibition. A QR code installed in a label also led visitors to versions of the videos on display that had closed captioning. Insurgents also existed beyond the exhibition gallery, mainly through two spoken word events, Resist, You Got Me Excellent, and the Frenetic Arts Open Mic Night for the opening of the exhibition. These events were video recorded and the performers were also invited to share their reflections, some of which were then displayed in the exhibition as well. Insurgents arguably also aimed to be reflexive and sustainable through creating a website for the exhibition and having a long-term display of the adopt to stop stop RH littering, roads and highways, bus shelter, which is still on museum grounds today. 
As Insurgents was developing, the Barbados Museum was also involved in the EULAC Museums project of which Alessandra Cummings was a principal investigator. And it was here that myself and the museum's education officer, Kay Hall, formalized a co-curatorial methodology drawn from practices in the museum for the creation of an exhibition, The Enigma of Arrival, The Politics and Poetics of Caribbean Migration to Britain. ELAC Museums was an international multi-institution project that aimed to foster intercultural dialogue and creativity through regional and community museums in order to develop associated history and theory. The Barbados Museum is a participating organization in the project under the University of the West Indies, embarked on a series of research aimed at critical revisionist exhibition practices. The Enigma of Arrival was co-led by myself and Kay Hall and is significant as a Caribbean-based exhibition on post-war migration from the region to Britain. The exhibit based on research from first-hand oral history accounts and the experience and records from the West Indies Federal Archives combined multivocal co-curatorial methods with expressions through literature, music, theater, and visual art. In keeping with the evolving paradigm of museums as responsible social actors, Enigma was intended to provide new opportunities for the Caribbean region's museums and communities to co-curate previously unarticulated national and regional narratives. It was here that a community of curatorial practice was created as the exhibition framework. This curatorial framework is derived from Levin Wenger's pedagogical concept of a community of practice, which speaks to a social theory of learning through a set of relations among persons, activity, and the world over time and in relation with other tangential and overlapping communities of practice. The community of curatorial practice in a museum context suggests cyclical approaches around exhibition content, connection, practice, and sustainability. Within exhibition content, collaborative research was a key component of this framework to provide meaning and shared identity. A preliminary research team from the University of the West Indies and the Barbados Museum collectively worked on developing themes that might be key in sharing the histories of the Windrush generation through postgraduate students, while another significant collaborator was Claude Graham and the Caribbean Broadcasting Corporation. Mr. Graham had developed a series of television programs between the years 1990 to 2000, inquiring into the experiences of the second generation, tackling topics of cultural identity, racism, economic mobility, rep repatriation, and social integration. This content contributed greatly to humanizing the historical and political aspects of the Windrush migration. Co-curation as the lead process was another key aspect of the methodology. An open call was released for communities and institutions to share objects and images in their own collections that they would like to see in the exhibition. The curatorial direction was shaped by the images that were received, and after an initial review of the contents, the exhibition materials were also shared with professional peers for feedback. This multivocality from the design stage right through to a peer review of the exhibition material allowed for interest and experience to be in the content and built a community of practice with colleagues in Barbados, the Caribbean, and beyond. Sustainable exchanges comprise the final aspect of the community of curatorial practice methodology. The exhibition panels were shared as an invitation for groups to host the exhibition as part of their own Windrush, migration, Windrush or migration commemorations and programming. Although the exhibition was on display at the Barbados Museum in 2019, it has traveled in the region and diaspora growing with each iteration as the host communities and institutions take ownership of the exhibitions and present it in their own way. This included at the Rutherford Building Library at Goldsmiths University in London, a community-led iteration in Birmingham by Second Generation Barbadians and Friends Association, the University of the West Indies Museum, Mona Campus in Jamaica, Reading Museum in the UK, the Windrush Legacy Foundation in the UK, the Black Professional Network Vodafone in the UK and St. Andrews University in Scotland. An integral part of sustaining the model of community of curatorial practice was also the program of public awareness and education activities surrounding the development of the exhibitions in their respective areas. These include a lecture series, a 
applied theater, online engagement through the virtual museum, and two publications. Programming has also yielded a number of opportunities for reflexivity in the model of a community cur of curatorial practice. How is it? What are the challenges? How can it work? How can it be adapted across different museums and communities? And we've welcomed feedback and interest in the demonstration of the sustainability of the model to facilitate community memory. Given these reflections on recent curatorship at the Barbados Museum and Historical Society, it is arguably an organization that openly grapples with our colonial beginnings and is working towards more inclusive exchanges within our space. The exhibitions like Artistic Interventions, Insurgents and Enigma have expanded our understanding of community-led curatorship and how it can shape the narratives that we share in the museum. Of course, the challenge is that these projects have been somewhat transient in nature, although they do still exist online. But what is key is that their theoretical frameworks have greatly informed the museological approach for our core gallery redesign, which through the theme, Our Stories, Our Museum, aims to recontextualize the way in which we share historical narratives of Barbados on display in our long-term exhibits, led by the voices of the communities we serve. There is still work to be done, but democratic curatorship through these exhibitions provides a signpost for the continual shift in the museological direction of the Barbados Museum and our continued commitment to multivocality and inclusivity as we approach our 90th year. Thank you. Thank you so much, Natalie, for that engaging look at uh, the museum's work with a community of curatorial practice. Uh, for those of you who may have questions for Natalie based on her contribution, uh, you can either, if you are in the Zoom um, part of the, the presentation, you can raise your hand or you can put your question in the Q&A. If you are on Facebook, you can put your chat in the, your, your comments in the chat. You can put your questions, sorry, in the comments section. Um, Please don't be shy. Uh, we would, I think, really love to, to hear feedback from you with regard to the museum's um, attempt to establish a community of curatorial practice, which includes everyone um, who has an interest in Barbadian history from across the diaspora. While we wait um, to see um, whether or not our audience has questions, uh, Nahli, would you like to tell us maybe a little bit more about what the museum has planned in terms of upcoming projects that the public can get involved in, that our communities can get involved in um, if, if they want to be a part of what we have coming up? Yeah, I think there is a ton of projects and programs um, that just depends on the nature of the interest of those that are connecting with us. We have a really exciting exhibition coming up in July, working with um, women artists who work primarily in photography, who have done a revision of our um, historical postcard collection and are creating works in response and in conversation with that postcard collection. Um, so I think that kind of follows along the same vein and that very much has um, so far been a very co-curatorial approach in terms of every decision of the exhibition framework, the design, the research approach has been a collective effort um, between the museum as an institution and the five artists that we're working with. Um, but also maybe I can put my email in the chat and anybody who is interested in connecting with the museum on a variety of projects um, can connect with me. It doesn't seem that I might be able to send it to everybody. I'm not sure, Lachey, maybe you have access to share in the chat to all of the attendees. Hey, you're muted. 
Li Shi, she was asking you if you could share her your her email address to everyone. Hello. It's in the chat. Thank you. Uh, we had a question while you were answering. Um, someone asked online if the Zoom presentation was going to be available at a later date. Uh, for those of you who are listening, um, yes, it will. It is going to be on our Facebook archive there, and there will also be a copy of it archived on YouTube under the playlist for this lecture series. Uh, we have another question from Sherry in Barbados. She says, many cultural institutions and the museum are predominantly staffed by, by females. How can we encourage more male engagement? I think there's something kind of interesting and maybe not um, an, a negative thing that Caribbean museums in particular are led by women. Um, I think it very much kind of interjects into that notion of a patriarchal leadership across all different sectors. Um, I would direct Cherry actually to an article that Alessandra wrote in the 90s about women in museums um, to learn a little bit more about that and the significance of it. Uh, but I do see your point about male engagement um, I think what has been fortunate with us at the council level at the museum, you know, our council is led by uh, the wonderful Sir Trevor Carmichael. Um, and we do have a lot of engagement at that level um, from men, as well as through, you know, a surprising number of our community groups. Um, I don't think there's any disparity in gender in terms of our community programming. So the engagement through that, even though if the staff, you know, may be predominantly female. Um, particularly curatorial staff, we do see that coming through. So I hope that answers. Mm -hmm. um, I am not seeing, oh, wait, wait, wait. Uh, nope, that was just Sherry saying thank you. I thought there was another question coming in. Um, it is not looking like if we have any more questions. Let me just very quickly, um, no, I'm not seeing any more questions right now. Um, so Nahli, I would therefore like to thank you very much for your time this evening. And those of you who have attended both in Zoom and on Facebook, thank you very much for attending this evening and for giving us your time and attention. Um, as mentioned earlier, it will be archived on Facebook and on YouTube. Nahli, would you like to say something else? I just noticed that Harriet Pierce has her hand up in the attendees. Oh. I'm sure she had a question. Sorry to interrupt, Kate. No, no, that's fine. Uh, Harriet, do go ahead. I'm not seeing her raised hand. So thank you very much, Nahali, for pointing that out. Um, her microphone may need to be enabled. I'm not sure. Hmm. Go ahead, Harriet. Yeah. Uh, hi, everyone. Sorry about that, but I'm not sure why my hand was raised. <laughs> I didn't actually do it, so I'm sorry. But since I'm here, I want to thank Nahli for an interesting presentation. Thank you, Harriet. Okay, well, thank you very much, Harriet, for that. And uh, thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Thank you, Nahli, for your time and your expertise this evening. It was a very engaging presentation. Uh, just a reminder to everyone, it will be available archived both on Facebook and um, on YouTube in the lecture series playlist. And uh, next week, please join us as we conclude the lecture series uh, with our director, Ms. Alessandra Cummins, who will talk to us about the making, the origins of a museum in the island of Barbados. Thank you so much, everyone, and have a wonderful evening.